thank you very much for inviting me. This is a very, very great honor. Um, thank you very much to the organizers for thinking of me. Um, so, um, so what I am planning to talk about is, is very much uh, related to what Professor Koenig uh, talked about this morning and also the, the other day. Um, so it's the same equation. It's box u is minus u to the 5 uh, in 3 plus 1 um, space um, time dimensions. And my sign convention is slightly different, so I hope it doesn't confuse you. It's the focusing um, critical uh, energy critical wave equation. Um, now, so ju just quickly, maybe uh, if you think, why, why do you care about this very specific model? Um, the reason um, is, I like to think, is, is because um, it kind of reflects a lot of um, phenomena that, that you encounter in other equations. And um, a lot of the techniques um, which are, have been recently developed for this equation um, have helped uh, and are in the process of helping elucidating more physical equations. Um, for example, um, methods by uh, Koenig and Mel have helped uh, me and uh, collaborators uh, address problems about critical wave maps and maxwell and gordon and other equations. And so it seems a very rich source of inspiration uh, for, for new techniques. Um, so, uh, for, for example, the wave maps from R2 plus 1 into S2 or the critical Young-Mills equation on R4 plus 1 shares a lot of properties. And we hope that we, we can then say more things about those equations once we understand this somewhat uh, silly uh, model equation here. Now, uh, so, so in, in Kenick's talk, we heard a lot about type 2 solutions. Um, now, it turns out that for this kind of equation, the type 2 solutions are something very unstable and very atypical. However, um, for very trivial reasons, for these two more physical models, all dynamics are type 2. And that's why an understanding of type 2 uh, dynamics is such a natural and important thing. Okay. So, um, now, so, so let me just go very quickly over some, some of the terrain that uh, Professor Koenig uh, covered in his, his talk. Um, so, uh, as we know, the, the energy critical wave equation is it's well posed in H, H1. Uh, so, may maybe somewhat more precisely, we can say it's strongly well posed in H1 plus nu for any new positive, in the sense that you can then indicate a time interval um, whose length is going to depend just on the norm. If you only work at the level of H1, then it, the, the length of existence somehow depends also on the profile of, of the initial data. Um, so, the, the equation is strongly well posed in H1 plus, and so, from my point of view, um, any kind of solutions that you can construct in uh, of regularity H1 plus are honest solutions. They're, they're interesting solutions. Um, uh, you don't necessarily have to inquire C infinity solutions. You can also ask for H1 plus and they're true solutions. They're not some artifacts. Um, so, uh, so there, as we, we know, there's, there's a conserved energy um, which has ambiguous sign. And, um, and this, this is responsible for the fact that uh, you have type 1 and type 2 dynamics because you do not a priori have control over the uh, H1 dot norm of, of the solution. So uh, just to remind you, uh, uh, type 1 solutions are those for which the, uh, the space-time gradient of U has uh, infinite supremum of its L2 norm on its interval of existence. And again, the interval of existence um, is, is the maximal lifespan in the sense of Schotter-Struve. Um, in the sense that uh, the LT5 LX10 norm says is, is, is finite, but it gets infinite as you approach the extremities of this interval. So, um, on the other hand, we have type 2 uh, dynamics, which are given by this requirement here that uh, we have a priori uh, a bound on, on the, uh, L2, uh, uh, of the uh, L2 norm of the spacetime gradient of the solution. And uh, as we heard, so the, um, the, the type 2 dynamics and type 1 dynamics are quite, quite different. Um, uh, it's very easy to exhibit type 1 dynamics uh, of singular character um, by taking the ODE uh, solution and uh, truncating it to ensure that it's, it's finite energy, say. Um, and and these, these were known, of course, for eternity. I mean, this, this is trivial to construct. However, type 2 dynamics uh, of an interesting character are much, much, much more subtle, as we, as we learned, and um, are, are more recent phenomenon to understand them. Now, uh, so as we know, so, so there's, uh, there's been a lot of interest in this model, in part also because of this doikot scanning mail program, um, uh, which uh, enabled to get a complete abstract understanding of all these um, type 2 dynamics. Um, and, and also, again, like uh, um, uh, understanding type 2 dynamics here most likely is going to help us understanding them as well for critical wave maps and young males, which are more physical models, and, and that's why this is a really natural thing to do. 
and uh, in particular for wave maps from R2 plus 1 into S2, where the structure of static solutions seems to be much simpler. Um, uh, the, so certainly, I mean, uh, there, there's, there, there, there's waiting to be a very, very neat picture in terms of the solitone resolution here to be uncovered for this model and similarly for the uh, critical young Mills equation. Okay. So, okay, so now let's uh, approach these type 2 dynamics. So as we know um, um, from the work of, of the 80s um, and, and geometrical works, so people have known for a long time that there are these static solutions W of x, um, finite energy, um, uh, time independent solutions of the corresponding uh, elliptic problem, Laplace u is minus u to the 5. Uh, correspondingly, we have the family of rescalings. And uh, um, uh, up to, so I forgot, up to a sign, these are the only um, radial um, static solutions um, of this problem. And uh, throughout this talk, I will basically make a radiality uh, assumption, so I will not, not discuss the non-radial case uh, here. Okay. So uh, what is the key quest? Um, so on the one hand, you want to completely characterize all type 2 solutions in an abstract fashion, and you do that by just working in the energy space, and you get these kind of beautiful um, solitone resolution pictures um, of, of Koenig and, and Mel. But then uh, the, I'd like to add some other things that you'd like to understand, which is, well, I mean, can you actually give me solutions that do what's being described in the soliton resolution? And uh, can you tell me what does it mean if somebody takes his computer and m the, uh, runs the equation on the computer? Will he see this? What will he see? Uh, what is their stability of these solutions? And uh, kind of uh, what has emerged, I think, uh, in, in, in recent times, is that to understand these stability issues um, uh, for these solutions, uh, it very much hinges on the topology that you're working in. So if you just work in the energy topology, you get a hell of, of an instability for these problems. However, if you impose somewhat more regularity, then suddenly these things become more rigid and you start to, to get a better idea, you, you, you can capture them somehow. And to get a fuller understanding, you have to vary the regularity in these things. And what's, that's very interesting because somehow uh, hyperbolic problems apparently have more, uh, they allow more of a range in regularities which get preserved by the flow, whereas for parabolic problems it's more rigid somehow. You, these things have smoothing properties, so you, you, you don't have a H3 half solution, but here you do. And, and so th this, this regularity issue very much influences what kind of dynamics you get. Okay, so now, so here I, I give you a statement of, of DKM, the strongest form, which I, I think is an absolutely fantastic theorem. So, so, um, so it says that if you have a, again, I mean, we heard it this morning, but here is it again. So uh, if you have a type 2 solution which breaks down in, in finite time, then you can pick scales, lambda j of, of t, um, which we can arrange in decreasing order such that if you take the limit of these quotients here, they, they approach infinity as i is less than j. And also you always have this requirement that these parameters have to blow up strictly faster than the self-similar rate um, uh, um, uh, 1 over t minus uh, big t minus little t, where big t is the blow up time, such that you can then write your solution as, as a sum of these profiles up to sine, plus an error term, and the error term, as we learned this morning, you may think of as a solution to the linear uh, wave equation, because if you're close enough to the blow-up time, uh, this thing is going to solve the, the nonlinear wave equation, but it's well approximated by the linear, corresponding linear flow. So, so really, I mean, you can think of this as a linear object here. So, so you have this beautiful uh, description, and similarly, if you're in the infinite time case, then you don't even have to impose um, uh, type 2, because automatically such solutions, if they exist globally in time, they're, they're type, uh, type 2. And there's the same picture. You get these, uh, these parameters. Um, they satisfy formally the same requirement, such that the solution decouples as the sum of these profiles plus uh, a linear term. So um, now, on the other hand, the program uh, of, of Deutsch's Kinetic Mel does not a priori furnish um, ways to realize such dynamics other than the W itself. And uh, again, it does not give information directly about the stability. However, as I will argue, as I will mention later on, it provides a very powerful tool to understand stability of certain solutions in certain situations. So we have already used, in fact, in, in some joint work, I've already used this classification to show that you get a certain type of behavior of solutions in a very specific solution. Um, so, uh, all right. So, so now, so my point of view here is I want to have constructive techniques for exhibiting type 2 phenomena. Now you can say, okay, so this is very academic. Why am I doing this? Why do I care about exotic solutions? Well, 
on the one hand, I think that that allows me to also understand other equations better. On the other hand, I mean, it is really like the techniques that come out of this are extremely useful, I've found. I've some of these techniques that we developed in the context of this equation have been used for quasi-linear equations in the meantime and so on. So it's, 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 it's a very rich source of natural techniques. Okay. And also, I mean, it's, it's a big mystery because I think we are still very far away from understanding really what are all the possible type 2 solutions and what are their stability properties? How do we quantify that somehow? Okay. So now, so let's go back to some very primitive origins. So <coughs> the, the, the first time that I, I learned about this equation was in 2004 about, this was well before um, the Deutschland scanning mail program. And at the time, I don't think very much was known about this equation. Uh, people knew the small data theory. Um, people knew about the ODE blow up. And then there were some uh, um, numerical results. Um, people had done numerical techniques, in particular um, um, Kyoto Bison. And he had seen that by sort of like taking a nice bump initial data, multiplying that with a, with a scaling factor, and then varying that scaling factor, he could sort of by fine tuning, he could realize type two solutions, in particular the W, as kind of a threshold solution that divided um, scattering solutions from blow up solutions. So at that point, so, so Schlag and myself, we were thinking, okay, so maybe we can depart from this W, the static solution, and we can sort of try to understand its stability. And you do this very naively by simply adding a perturbation. You get a, a wave equation for this perturbation, and you try to understand, can you control that solution? Um, and uh, so it turns out that uh, very naturally, you're being led to a modulation of the W. So remember W sub lambda, it, it's, the, uh, it's a lambda to the one half times w of, of lambda x. And in this, uh, the natural thing to do is to actually let this w, this lambda, let it vary with time. And what we could show is that if you put um, a perturbation which is very nice, in particular the perturbation had to satisfy a certain vanishing condition, a code I mentioned one vanishing condition, and it had to be compactly supported, that's a technical point that can be strengthened. Uh, however, we managed to construct solutions which decouple into a so slightly modulated ground state plus a radiation term, and the radiation term um, actually scattered in a suitable sense. Uh, more precisely, we arranged that this, uh, mo that this uh, modulation scaling factor, lambda of t, um, converged toward a limit at time infinity. And then you could show that if you write the solution in this form, then this v infinity part scatters to zero. Okay, so, so again, what was the idea behind this construction? Well, you linearize, obviously, around w. And if you forget for now about the modulation, you will obtain the following elliptic operator here, minus Laplace minus 5w to the 4. And um, you can study its spectrum. You find that if you restrict to radial, uh, uh, radial functions, then you have one negative eigenvalue um, corresponding to a positive eigenfunction g, which decays exponentially at infinity. And you also have a resonance at, the, the, uh, at 0. This means it's almost like an eigenfunction, but it's, it's slightly weaker. And this simply comes from the scaling invariance of the equation. If you take w lambda and you differentiate with respect to lambda, then you get a function which, which is a resonance which gets killed by this, this operator. If you apply the operator to it, it vanishes. Okay. Um, and so now if, if you just think in terms of the linear approximation of this equation, then you, in general, because of this negative eigenvalue, you get exponential growth at infinity. So if you just look at the linear uh, equation, um, UTT is equal to LU, um, you're being led to impose this natural co-dimension one condition to avoid this, to prevent the solution from blowing up exponentially at infinity. Now, of course, so here we have a, a nonlinear problem, so you have to take the nonlinear interactions into account, but it's, it's fairly natural to expect that you should get sort of a co-dimension one um, set of initial data which uh, correspond to, good, to a good perturbation in positive times all the way up to infinity. There is a technical issue uh, because of this resonance here. The resonance somehow um, prevents the corresponding wave flow corresponding to this operator from having good dispersive um, estimates. And so you kind of have also to enforce kind of an orthogonality to this, to this um, resonance. And what does we do by means of modulating in lambda? So that's why, why you have to let lambda depend on time. And uh, so I and then now here comes, the, it comes, the to uh, comes in the topology. Um, you, have, you get an error terms if you modulate in this fashion and you, you move the error that you make to the right-hand side. Um, you get errors which are in some sense very bad. And uh, to control these errors, because you have to integrate at the end in time because of the UML formula, um, you have to make sure that lambda of t converges sufficiently rapidly to lambda infinity. 
And this requires imposing a lot of decay on this perturbation at time zero, at, in, at infinity, and also enough smoothness. So, so you, get, you get this stability uh, up to a co-dimension one set of W only if you work in a very, very, very strong topology. Okay? Now, so the technique for this, at the time we used these resolvent expansions in which uh, Schlag is an, uh, an expert. Um, however, now we would rather use uh, the Fourier kind of techniques for doing this, which would be, would be somewhat simpler. Um, and uh, so, so again, so, so here we have to work in a very strong topology to kind of avoid the full complexity of possible dynamics that's uh, coming from uh, Koenig and, and Mel, uh, Deukert's Koenig Mel. And uh, so, so somehow we tame the dynamics by working in a sufficiently strong topology near the ground state. Okay. Now, okay, so, so we have, we had purely uh, technically, so we had this co-dimension one uh, manifold here, which passes through the initial data of the static, static solution. Um, but uh, so the reason why there was this co-dimension one set was uh, just for technical reasons. We didn't really understand if this kind of hypersurface, which I call sigma in the statement of the, of the theorem, um, corresponding to the solutions in this theorem, um, if, if this has some sort of like intrinsic uh, characterization. Um, and so from, from the work of Bison, we expected that this manifold should play the role of some kind of threshold between two types of, of, of dynamics, but at the time we didn't understand it. However, uh, a couple of years later, actually eight years later, um, so we realized that uh, indeed um, one can show directly that um, if you perturb the initial data on this hypersurface sigma either in this direction or in this direction, so above or below. And you do that by adding a multiple of the unstable, the unstable mode. Um, you can actually um, trap the corresponding solution in two totally different regimes. Um, either um, if you kind of go above, say, then your solution is going to blow up. Um, or if you, you go below, your solution is going to scatter toward uh, zero. And um, to prove this result, in particular, to prove the uh, scattering to zero part of this theorem, we had to use the Deukert's Koenig Mel theorem. And, uh, okay, so how did we do this? So the idea basically was that you look at the family of rescaled initial data, lambda w sub lambda zero, and uh, so we show that as you perturb your initial data slightly in this direction, and you take a small tubular neighborhood here of this uh, one-dimensional family of rescalings, your solution actually, as a matter of fact, is going to move away from this uh, small tubular neighborhood here, and it gets trapped in two possible regimes. And these regimes can be classified by a functional k of u. So this functional k of u is the integral del x u squared minus u to the six dx. And uh, so, as a matter of fact, it turns out that either the solution gets trapped in a regime where this functional is always positive, or it gets trapped in a regime where this functional is always negative. And in the case where the functional is always negative, um, you can use a Levine-type blow-up argument to show that your solution is going to blow up. On the other hand, if it gets trapped in this regime here, then you can show, first of all, that the solution is type 2. Um, that's a very simple argument just involving um, the energy. <laughs> Uh, second, you then know that if a solution in this regime were to develop a singularity, um, you would have the classification by Dorcott's uh, Koenig and Mel. And then you show that, as a matter of fact, if um, such a scenario were to happen, the solution would have to kind of come back into a small neighborhood of this one-dimensional family of rescalings. And to rule that out, um, there is a so-called um, type one, uh, uh, one pass theorem, which we prove, which relies on a simple um, virial identity, which rules that out. So, so this was a very, I thought, a very nice application of, of Deukert's Koenig Mel to control a very explicit dynamics in, in a situation like this. Okay. So, okay, so, so here is, is this result. Um, um, the, uh, the still, the, in the case where you have blow up um, um, uh, for these perturbations, um, there we don't know um, if it's type one, it should be type one, but we don't know how to show this, no idea. Okay, so now uh, how about constructing type two solutions which blow up in finite time? So there clearly is something very different has to be done uh, than in the preceding theorem uh, uh, with Schlag and from 2004. Um, and the reason is because such a solution will have to be of the form W sub lambda of T of X plus V of T and X. 
And the lambda here is going to vary a lot. And so we do not expect to be able to um, very well approximate such, such functions, uh, u of t and x, as solutions of a wave equation with a fixed reference wave operator somehow. It's not so clear how to do that. So this is a very different kind of situation because before the lambda of t was very, very little. In this case, we expect the lambda of t to be varying enormously. Okay, and, and nevertheless, um, so um, we have the following result, which actually goes back to 2007. Um, this is joined with Slack and Tataru. Um, so there exist um, type two blow up solutions where lambda of t is of the form t to the minus one minus nu. So it's a very explicit uh, law, scaling law. Um, provided, uh, so in this work, we had to restrict nu to bigger than one half. Um, and, uh, so, so, so the way I've written it, so you, get, you can decouple the solution into the bulk term. Um, the bulk term concentrates at time zero at uh, the origin, plus a term v of tx, which remains regular. And uh, somewhat interestingly, so as a byproduct of our construction, these solutions are actually not of class C infinity, they are of lesser regularity, h1 plus nu halves. So um, that seems to be a kind of uh, something which is really germane to, to hyperbolic equations. So where did these kind of solutions come from? Um, as a matter of fact, they were simply a byproduct of um, work that we did on the critical wave maps equation at the time. At the time, uh, we wanted to understand um, blow up solutions for wave maps from R2, R2 plus 1 um, into S2. There was lots of numerical evidence that wave maps um, from R2 plus 1 into S, S2 develop singularities. And uh, so in 2006, uh, also in joint work with Schlag Tataro, we showed that indeed uh, you get blow-up solutions in that model here. And they're of exactly the same form if you replace W by the corresponding ground state for wave maps, which is a harmonic map. And we realized that this exactly same technique could simply be used in, in this model here. So we got these funny type two solutions. And at the time, there was not the DKM program yet, but maybe they served as a little bit of a motivation to pursue such a, a program to have such solutions uh, in, in your hand. Um, now, uh, so building such solutions is actually not very trivial. So the next type of uh, two solution for a similar model was constructed uh, three years later um, by Raphael and Hilaire um, for the uh, nonlinear wave, the critical nonlinear wave in, in four plus one dimensions, uh, which is of this form. And they have a very different scaling law. So their scaling law is lambda of t is t to the minus one times e to the square root log t. So this expression here is faster than any power, blows up faster than any power of the logarithm, but it's slower than any power of, of t. So these kind of solutions somehow they are strictly in between t inverse and t to the minus one minus nu, which were the rates that we had before, right? And uh, uh, then more recent, so f again after five year lapse, uh, there's recent work by uh, Jacek Gendre um, who uh, constructs again polynomial blow up rates. This is kind of more similar to the ones that um, I displayed before in five plus one dimensions. And he, uh, he gets a better control on the stability of such solutions and char characterizes that in terms of the radiation that comes out at the blow up time. So um, now, uh, so the, the Ilere Raphael result, um, so it doesn't just give explicit examples, but they also have an argument, or at least they mention in that paper, that their solutions are co-dimension one stable. So again, you get this kind of picture as, as in the theorem from 2004, but this time for uh, type two blow up solutions. And so uh, this suggested uh, to uh, Sherlock and myself that uh, in principle, you should be able to extend the result uh, from 2009 uh, here um, to the full range of news uh, uh, for possible blow up uh, solutions. And um, uh, in fact, um, so this, this seems even more interesting because, because somehow solutions with smaller nu here, uh, which are closer to the self-similar rate, the inverse, they should somehow be more stable. And um, so uh, in fact, so you might hope that for solutions of, of this form, maybe you can even again establish this kind of co-dimension one stability result uh, for these types of solutions. And uh, okay, so explicit examples for the full range of possible polynomial rates, which are allowed in, in terms of the doikat kenig uh, classification. Um, this was obtained by Schlag and myself in 2012. Um, so the result is formally of exactly the same form. You get a bulk park, uh, part, which has gets rescaled according to this law, plus a radiation term. And of course, because nu is smaller for these uh, solutions, dh, one plus nu halves, um, 
radiation term here is of lesser regularity, but it's still strictly better than energy regularity, so this is still in the regime where, these, uh, where the equation is strongly uh, locally well posed. Now, so these, these types of solutions with small nu here are kind of the starting point for what I want to think about uh, what I've been working on very much uh, uh, recently. Um, and uh, I will get to that uh, soon. However, I would do a gross injustice if I didn't mention some of the other developments that have been taking place. Uh, um, uh, so more type 2 dynamics actually have been built, so there has been quite a fair amount of activity. Um, um, so on the one hand, uh, something which I very much liked, so I was visiting Paris and uh, I, I ran into Thomas Ducaire and he asked at the time they were completing um, the, um, the infinite time case of the characterization uh, of type 2 um, blow ups, uh, solutions, not blow up, I mean existing all the way up to time infinity. And he asked if, if he could build solutions which behave like that. And, uh, and then, so a result by Donninger and myself uh, showed that indeed there is again a continuum of such solutions. Uh, so this time these solutions exist all the way to time infinity and uh, the scaling parameter is t to the nu. A nu just has to be small enough in absolute value. It can be negative, it can be positive. So you can have solutions which vanish at infinity but don't scatter. Or you can have solutions which concentrate at infinity, get arbitrarily large. Um, but I mean, so they kind of blow up at infinity in some sense. Um, uh, and uh, so the optimal range here is unknown, also the optimal kind of regularity that you can get for such solutions. I would expect you could such construct such solutions of class C infinity. We could only construct them in class H1. I don't know. Um, so because we had to use techniques from the proof of Deukert's Kenig Mel to do this. Anyway. So and then, so you can say, okay, so almost all of these examples have this very specific polynomial scaling law. Can one maybe construct more general solutions with more general scaling laws? And an, an example of this was done by uh, Donninger, Huang, uh, Schlag, and myself, um, where we show that, as a matter of fact, you can impose a little bit of oscillation in these uh, new exponents. Uh, in, in effect, you can do any a lot there. I mean, you could do analytic functions here of a certain type. So it's, it's incredibly complicated. Interestingly, though, to construct such solutions, the new has to be large enough. So it had to be bigger than two. So somehow this uh, is concordant with the expectation thus that the larger new is in this, the more unstable these kind of solutions become. All right. And also, uh, I should mention there's been recent work, uh, very interesting, on multi-bubble type 2 solutions. So far, I've only talked about one bubble. Um, but uh, there's now also evidence for multi-bubble solutions due to Jacek Gendre. Uh, so he managed to construct solutions which exist uh, in infinite forward time and which decouple into, a, I guess, a static term and then a term which scales exponentially fast plus a term which, which decays. And then very interesting also in terms of like finite time blow up with two bubbles. So he showed that a negative result somehow. So you do not have a blow up solution with two profiles in finite time such that there is nothing left somehow. So it's exactly at the level of, of these two profiles. So somehow uh, in the radial case, right? So this it's very interesting. Maybe, um, maybe there is less variety in terms of these, uh, these uh, soliton resolutions in the radial case for finite time blow up. I don't know. Anyway, so, so these are interesting things. So, okay, so it's an incredible zoo of, of type two solutions, very complicated. And so the natural question again is, which ones are kind of the generic ones in terms of uh, optimal genericity that they can have? Uh, which ones we will probably never see? And um, again, so there is sort of a natural generalization of, of the result of Schlag and myself from 04, uh, which is in joint work with Nakanishi and Schlag, who goes back to 13, which shows that if you take any uh, kind of, uh, any type 2 solution, which is of the form uh, one um, rescaled ground state plus uh, an error term, and you assume that this error term is very small in the sense that it's space time. Uh, gradient has small L2 norm on the uh, interval of existence of the solution, um, then, um, then you can construct a stable manifold uh, Lipschitz, uh, Lipschitz uh, hyper uh, surface of co-dimension one in the energy space passing through that solution such that if you go below this surface, this hyper surface, you will scatter to zero. If you go above, you will blow up, but we cannot say anything about what, what kind of blow up you will get if you go above. And if you take data on that hyper surface, you will be of type two. Okay, so again, so this, this kind of reinforces the belief that type two solutions in general 
in some sense are a co-dimension one phenomenon, a very unstable phenomenon, but not that unstable in the sense that you may be able to, um, to prove stability of such solutions on, on this co-dimension one hypersurface here. And that's, that's kind of the, the, the question that, that I've, um, I wanted to address. So um, let's say you take one of these type two solutions, you construct this co-dimension one hypersurface passing through it, through its data. Um, of course, this, this hypersurface is stable under the flow. Um, on, this, on this hypersurface, you get uh, type two dynamics. If you go below and above, you get either scattering to zero or blow, blow up of a probably different type. Uh, and now the question is, so what happens if you take your type two solution and you perturb it along this hypersurface? So what does this, what does this type two solution do? Now again, this, this may seem like a very academic question, but remember if you transplant this question to critical wave maps, then you don't have a co-dimension one hypersurface, you're generic, you're, your type two is, is anything you get. And the kind of techniques you develop to answer this question may then help you better understand stability of blow up for critical wave maps, for example. Okay. And so, so the result uh, is uh, the following. Um, so this joint work with Schlock uh, is work in progress. So assume that, um, that you have um, a type two blow up solution of the type which um, uh, was constructed by Schlock and myself in uh, 2012. Uh, I guess uh, basically you have to require nu to be sufficiently small in lambda of t. And uh, I, th I think like nu bigger th less than one third is enough. So it doesn't have to be extremely small, but just small enough. Then, um, you, if you take a perturbation, which consists of a triple here, so what does it mean? Uh, epsilon zero and epsilon one are the perturbation projected onto the part that's perpendicular to the unstable mode, and gamma gives um, part of the initial data corresponding to the unstable mode. Um, then, um, if you impose a further co-dimension one condition on this triple here, then there exists a Lipschitz continuous function, gamma tilde, such that the corresponding the, the initial data of this form lead to a finite time blow up solution, which is again of this form here. So it has the same uh, uh, law lambda of t. Okay? So basically what it means is that, um, what it means is that uh, in terms of this, this hypersurface, which I mentioned before, this code I mentioned one hypersurface, passing now through the data of my, uh, my type two solution, which I perturb, you get sort of like a foliation of this thing here. Right? You expect to get some kind of foliation here. Um, and so the, the, the branch of this foliation that goes through my actual type two solution, um, data corresponding to this branch here, they will result in the same type of blow up and other branches will correspond to different types of blow up here. So you can say, okay, fine. So that almost seems to imply stability because of course, if I then perturb in this direction, I will simply fall on a different, of, uh, a different leaf here. But um, uh, there the problem is that the topology has to be strong enough for these perturbations. I need to impose three halves derivatives and nu is very small. So the, the solution which I perturb is of regularity just barely above H1 and the perturbation is of much higher regularity. And this means that these leaves that I have here on this hypersurface are infinitely far apart. And so uh, to get a better result somehow you probably have to relax the, the lambda of t law. So you cannot impose exactly t to the minus one minus nu, you have to let it wiggle a bit, I think. That's probably what you have to do. But still, I mean, it's kind of surprising that you get that stability because you, could, you might as well think you get an infinite co-dimensional inst uh, stability for this because the scaling law is so special, lambda of t is t to the minus one minus nu, why should this be stable at all? But it, it seems to be, so, right? So, so what is this co-dimension? Okay. Condition? Oh, so I mean, roughly speaking, so uh, I mean, for, for these perturbations here, I can basically, I mean, it's of course a nonlinear kind of condition because it's a nonlinear equation, but to first order, you can think of it simply as a condition on the epsilon one, and you can write it that, it's not very complicated, you can write it as an integral has to vanish in terms of its Fourier transform with respect to the operator. It's not so complicated, it's pretty simple. It comes, it comes very naturally. So basically you see it if you simply approximate the equation in suitable coordinates by a linear equation, and you want to prevent a certain growth, which comes from the resonance, and you get a natural co-dimension co one condition. It's Okay, so now I don't know how much time I have left, but maybe I can talk a little bit about, uh, about the proof. Um, so, uh, okay, so again, like, so I say here that uh, probably you can improve this result if you let uh, the lambda of t be a bit more flexible than we do, but okay, so we're pretty happy with this result as is. 
Now, to, to understand this result, so unfortunately, um, you have to have a little bit of an idea how, the, how these solutions to, to Schlag, uh, Tatara, and myself, and then to Schlag and myself um, were constructed. And uh, in, in fact, um, it seems like in all of, of, of the solutions that have been exhibited so far, there's always a two-step procedure somehow. So the naive ansatz, which succeeded in the O4 theorem due to Schlag and myself, where you simply add a perturbation to your W and then you just solve the equation for this perturbation, doesn't work here. Instead, you have to sort of make the right ansatz. You have to perturb around the right object. You can't just perturb around W sub lambda of T, but you have to sort of replace that by something which is a more accurate approximate solution. And once you have the, the right approximate solution, which is good enough, then you can sort of complete things by, by solving the corresponding wave equation and just using general uh, parametrices and things, what have you. Okay? And uh, in our uh, case, so we like to use uh, Fourier analytic methods um, to do this. And we believe that these theory Fourier me theoretic methods are quite useful also in other contexts. And that's why, why, why we like to do it. So, Okay, so the first step, so if you start just with the, this naive ansatz around which you perturb, it's not going to work. And so um, what we do, already in the work with uh, Tataru, is that we, um, we sort of construct a sequence of better and better approximate solutions. So um, let's call this sequence UK. So each of these sequences are only approximate solutions, so they will solve the equation only approximately in the sense that this expression here is not going to be zero, but the larger k gets, the better this approximation becomes. Okay, so what do we do? Um, well, so uh, let's say I obtain the approximation uk from approximation uk minus one by adding a correction term vk. And vk is going to solve a corresponding wave equation which you obtain by linearizing around uk minus one in this, in this kind of expression and putting it equal to zero. And uh, so uh, now the problem is these are always wave equations. We don't know how to solve these wave equations. And so we would like to replace them by some sort of elliptic equations, which we know how to solve. So how can we replace our wave equation by an elliptic equation? One way seems totally dumb is, is to simply uh, forget about the, the, the time derivative and you get uh, this kind of equation here. That's something you can try. Another thing you can try is that you, you t retain the time derivative but you throw out the potential term, which is scary because it depends on time. That's what, what makes it so difficult. So we throw that out. And this is, it may seem very unnatural, but if you think about it, it's not so unnatural near the light cone where this potential term actually becomes extremely small. So near the light cone, this seems to be a good approximation of your equation, whereas near the origin, it turns out that this is a good approximation of the equation. So then to obtain the approximate uh, solutions, you iterate these two steps here. And now, uh, so this is still a wave equation. So why, why, how do you know how to solve this wave equation here? And here what intervenes is sort of a miraculous algebraic, maybe not miraculous, but a nice algebraic structure. It turns out that um, these terms, these error terms, can be very conveniently expressed in terms of the variable a, which I like to call a, which is the quotient r over t. And it turns out that if you sort of throw out lots of terms from these errors and you kind of reduce them to the principal part and express them in terms of t and this variable a, then you see that if you make the right ansatz for this correction v2k in this equation, which is of this form here, then you get a very nice uh, ODE, which is something we know how to solve, uh, an ODE for this correction. And this ODE, as you expected, is singular both at the origin and at the light cone. However, um, if, uh, so this, uh, this ODE, of course, will depend on my choice of lambda. So this is where the nu comes in here. You will see that there is a nu dependence. This coefficient beta depends on nu and the stage of the iteration you're at. And it turns out that if you choose nu positive, which is exactly the requirement that's given to you by Deukert's clinic mel um, the solutions of this, this kind of ODE here across the light cone, there are of regularity h1 plus something, nu halves. And that's exactly where the regularity, this kind of finite regularity of our solution comes from. And so it turns out that by, by um, so you can write down a fundamental system of, of solutions for this ODE and, and you can do that. Okay, <coughs> so, uh, so this is all very nice and consistent. And if you then comp compute the error terms which you're generating in this scheme, then um, these error terms, you see they decay faster and faster. They, this expression lambda times t, excuse me, this expression lambda times t, as t is t to the uh, lambda is t to the minus one minus nu, 
lambda times t uh, is, of course, uh, t to the minus nu. Lambda times t is t to the minus nu. And so if uh, this is something which blows up, and so this is something which becomes smaller and smaller, the larger k becomes. And so as you see, as you let k go to infinity, these errors in some sense disappear. They, become, they, they vanish. And so uh, to get my approximate solution, I now take the sum of all these corrections and add them to, to u0. Um, then you could say, oh, yeah, fine. So then I just get a series, and I get as my, my solution is the series of these corrections. But the series doesn't converge because you get larger and larger coefficients in it, which, which, which grow. And so at some point, you will have to stop. Otherwise, you get a divergent, just, just a formal solution. And so uh, this is exactly where we, where, we, uh, where we stop this process. And we add the final correction, which is obtained by solving a suitable wave equation now, or using standard wave uh, techniques. And we use uh, Fourier methods to do so. And uh, so why, why wasn't the original work by Tataru, uh, Schlag and myself only new bigger than one half? So there's a very technical reason. Because uh, somehow you need to control these terms epsilon to the five. And if you don't have quite enough regularity, you only have H1 regularity, then it turns out that somehow we had some issues here with these terms to control them. And, um, but uh, however, there's, there's a fairly simple fix around this. Um, so, so to explain this, so how do, where does this fix come from and how does one do this more, more precisely? So one passes to a new variable epsilon tilde, which is r times epsilon, that passes uh, things to a one-dimensional context. And one introduces new uh, coordinates, big R, which is lambda of t times little r, and tau, which is the integral of lambda of s. And one gets some hideous equation here, which has the advantage that in this equation, the elliptic operator, which is left this time independent, However, um, you, you replace, you pay a price, which is that the time derivative becomes this kind of dilation type operator, which is not unlike what we saw in the, in the talk by Mas Moody. Um, so you pay some kind of price and you get some kind of transportation operator instead. Okay? And then you have this nonlinearity here. Um, but, but the nice thing is that this operator is time independent now. And um, so then we pass to a Fourier representations that are associated with this operator L. For that, we have to understand the spectrum of L. That's easy to do using standard methods. It has continuous spectrum from 0 to infinity. Uh, it has one negative eigenvalue, which we know already. And it has a resonance at 0, which can be written down explicitly like this. And then any L2 function admits a, uh, a Fourier representation in terms of a generalized Fourier basis like this, plus uh, a multiple of the unstable mode. OK. So, so then what we'd like to do is we would like to solve this hideous wave equation that I had here by um, basically using a Fourier representation of epsilon tilde and uh, solving ODEs for every Fourier mode of epsilon tilde, like one does for the usual wave equation in R3 plus 1. Um, however, there is a problem there. And the problem is that uh, RDR does not become xi dx xi um, on the Fourier side anymore. Um, because these eigenfunctions phi r xi, they are not just e to the i r, e to the i r xi, they are something much more complicated. Um, you can describe them asymptotically, but uh, only implicitly somehow. You don't have an explicit formula for these kind of objects. And in particular, r d r does not become xi d xi. And if you want to translate r d r into xi d xi, you will generate error terms of this form here error terms which will be linear in, in the function that you're trying to solve for, which is bad somehow. Um, so you can do that. You uh, use the Fourier representation of your variable epsilon tilde. And you uh, recast your equation in this way in terms of its Fourier uh, modes. You have um, the principal part here, which has some kind of dilation operator here, applied to x. And then there's something hideous. There's something which depends linearly on x, plus everything that's left from all the nonlinear interactions and so on and so forth. Okay. And now, uh, so this, this linear term at first sight seems horrible because it might seem that you cannot iterate these terms away. You're not gaining smallness in an obvious way. In the work uh, with uh, Tataru and Schlag, there was sort of a wonderful trick uh, that enabled you to do it. It was simply the observation that if you simply force the error at the first stage where you stopped, if you force this error to decay fast enough in time, then by simply integrating over time, you pick up smallness just from basic calculus. Um, now, this is a trick which is not going to be useful for us if you try to understand stability of these solutions. Because uh, if I add perturbations to these solutions, they are going to mess up this kind of structure completely. So this is not going to work if I try to understand the stability, um, as, I, as I announced before. But OK, never mind. 
And so then in the work with uh, Schlag and Tataru, we then uh, introduce crude norms here um, in terms of the Fourier transform uh, and we do an iterative scheme. And the restriction that nu bigger than one half comes from the fact that you need to have an embedding of this form, which requires alpha to be large enough because alpha can be determined in terms of nu. Um, okay, this gives you the restriction on your nu. Uh, however, um, so the work with uh, uh, Schlag from 2012, we simply observed that this finite smoothness of our solutions is only a phenomenon on the light cone. And in the radial context, if you're away from the origin, you have better Sobolev embeddings. And therefore, this, this, this issue with not enough smoothness is really a non-issue, and you, you can, just by working carefully enough, you can extend uh, this, this iteration procedure all the way to nu bigger than zero, and um, you, get, you get this result. Okay, so now, all right, but I said I want to study stability of these solutions, so how do I do that? Um, well, uh, so you take such the initial data of such a solution and you add a perturbation to it, and you try to understand uh, what the evolution of the corresponding solution looks like. And uh, to a you know, zero uh, approximation, you look at the linear part of your equation for, for, for your perturbation. In terms of uh, the Fourier transform, you get this kind of equation here. And this equation can be completely explicitly solved. Uh, there's a parametrics which we can write down. And as you expect, um, if you perturb things at a fixed time and then you would solve the, the equation toward the singularity, um, you will get things which grow very rapidly, which, which explode uh, to as you approach the singularity. And in particular, um, in my, in my uh, coordinates, in my rescale coordinates, you get these kind of expressions here, lambda 3 halves tau, where tau uh, blows up as you approach the singularity. These, these things become very large, so they, 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 they blow up. And so that's a bad thing. So how, do you, how, how can this be useful? Because in the end you have to do an iteration and you want to control things. Uh, however, it turns out, I don't really care so much about the Fourier transform. I care about the epsilon tilde because the epsilon tilde is what I feed into the nonlinearity. And if epsilon tilde is not too bad, then I can control the nonlinear terms. And it turns out that if you actually study this integral here carefully and you plug in this kind of parametrics, then you find a very natural co-dimension one condition uh, I can write it down for you. It's like the integral from zero to infinity, rho to the one half, xi, x1 of xi. So this is just the time derivative part divided by xi to the power of three quarters times sine nu tau zero xi to the one half. The xi has to be equal to zero. This is a simple condition like that. And if I get that, then as a matter of fact, my epsilon tilde, it will still grow uh, because there's still a contribution from the, from the resonance, but it will only grow linearly. And if you go back into your e the equation, the way that we set it up, if I can still find it, ha, um, was before, aha. So you see, like the way that we set the up the equation, there is always a factor lambda to the minus two out front. And how does lambda, in terms of my variable tau, behave? Well, lambda, in terms of tau, is equal to tau to the one plus nu inverse. So the smaller I choose nu, the more lambda of tau explodes as tau goes to infinity. And this allows me, as a matter of fact, to use this factor to dominate the nonlinear term here if, it only, if epsilon tilde only grows linearly, if nu is small enough. And so that's the idea. So I'm over time, I'm sorry. First theorem you mentioned uh, yeah. about the stability uh, for stronger topology. Uh, my question is: Could you do it in high dimension, just in the energy space? Uh, so you mean like the one with Schlag? Yes, and prove uh, because you mentioned dispersive estimates. So could you do it in high dimension, just in the energy space? Well, no. As a matter of fact, I would think that you would need more somehow, right? Uh, no, actually, you're right. Yeah. Um, I think you would need more somehow, more regularity. I don't know, I, don't, I haven't thought about it, but I, I, I don't, it's not obvious to me. No, I think I would need more regularity somehow, but I don't know. But, yeah. yeah. Uh, in the 
solution which blow up in finite time, which you constructed by scaling this W by your lambda t with yeah. number power, uh, is there any control of the time of existence with respect to, for example, parameter mu? Well, yes, of course, you could make all that explicit. So you can, you could, we, I mean, we never do these things, so we just say, but I actually, uh, somebody tried to, uh, uh, a postdoc tried to, to actually make this very explicit and to actually solve it numerically on a computer even. Um, but it turned out to be more complicated than, <laughs> than we'd like. But uh, I, uh, yeah, you, you in principle, you should be able to make it explicit in terms of new, yeah. So what is explicit then? You would have to sit down and compute it. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, do you have an intuition for it? I don't know. Thank you again. Thank you. Sure, sure.